Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church here on Washington Street in Cumberland, Maryland. My name is Wesley Mason. I'll be your liturgist this morning for this Palm Sunday. Leading our service is our own Reverend Allison Peters. Our director of music ministries is Judy Brown. The flowers in the sanctuary this morning are given to the glory of God and loving memory of Neil Smith by Nancy and Royce Hodges. First Presbyterian Church is a place of love, hope, safety, forgiveness, and challenge. We are so glad you are here with us this morning. You are loved. And remember, together, we are the church. The first announcement this morning is from myself and the Interfaith Food Pantry. The individuals that work the Interfaith Food Pantry would like to thank you for all the donations that we have been making recently. I have been making plenty of trips to HRDC's Interfaith Food Pantry, and together with them, I thank you, and I ask that you please just keep donating. As you know, it's a great cause for our community, and you may do so in the hallway as you walk in. This week, of course, is Holy Week. There are multiple services you can attend. Monday, Thursday, 6.30 here at First Presbyterian Church. On Good Friday, there will be the walking stations at the cross at 12 p.m. And on Sunday, the early rise service, sunrise service at Rocky Gap at 7, and then the traditional service here in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. We will also, this afternoon after service, be having a Palm Sunday brunch and Easter egg blessing you're welcome to attend downstairs. Let us continue in worship. Please rise and body your spirit and join with me in the call to worship and prayer for the day as printed in your bulletin. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we are broken. Come and be seen. We gather in this Lenten season knowing we need forgiveness. Come and be heard. We gather in this Lenten season knowing our hearts long for God. Come and be loved. We gather in this Lenten season, knowing God calls us all. Come as you are. Let us pray. God, we bring our full selves into this space. As we worship, help us to sense your presence. As we listen, give us understanding. As we move forward, let us have courage for your goodness endures forever, and we offer our praise. Amen. Now let us join in song as we sing hymn 197, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
Please be seated. We are a people of confession. We serve a God who is faithful, a God who helps us to change, so we confess our sins, knowing that we need places for God to help us change. So let us journey together this holy week as we start with the prayer of confession. God Almighty, creator of all things, you are the source of our life, the source of our light. And yet all too often, we fail to stop and pause. We fail to acknowledge our need for you. The world spins so fast, and we find ourselves easily caught in the whirlwind of chaos. We look for quick fixes, for cheap miracles, rather than taking the time to seek your face. We chase after what is easy and what is fast, rather than seeking what is difficult and what is everlasting. Help us on this Sunday of Palms to take time to look to you. Give us wisdom to seek the slower way this week, that we may take our time on the journey to the cross. Grant that we may journey through this holy week with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our minds. Amen. We see the proof of God's amazing love as Christ journeys through Holy Week. Though derided and ridiculed, beaten and killed, Christ loved us enough to take up the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We know how important community is, this community that celebrates here in the sanctuary, the community that joins us online. We are so much stronger when we are united and together. So let us take a moment to celebrate that as we pass the peace of Christ to one another. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, 
Let us listen for a word from the Lord. When he had come near Bethage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of powers that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
In our first reading this morning, we heard the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem with great excitement and the great crowd ushering him in. But it was a humble entrance. This entrance was in contrast to the political leaders who were entering Jerusalem the same day on the other side of town. That group was flanked by soldiers and had mighty horses and chariots as they were coming into the city. That entry was a vision of power and glory and might. Everything shined up, boosting egos. Yet, we heard a story of a humble rabbi riding a borrowed donkey entering the city to show a different way, a way that is gentle and affirming, a way that's not trying to seek or assert dominance, but allowing space for all people. And the shouts that the people were saying were, Hosanna, which means, save us. Instead of celebrating warriors and violence, they are pleading for this other way. And while that moment is marked by jubilation and anticipation, as the people recognize Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, there is still a sense of urgency. That is how the larger story of Holy Week begins And what we are entering into is one week in the life of Jesus. It's just a tiny snapshot in time. But it is filled with so much, and we also know that there is so much missing. So we are going to go from that moment of entry and here the middle to almost the end of the story. As hard as some of it is for us to hear, it is crucial for us as we make our way to Easter. You can't skip from the palms and the pleading to an empty tomb. So with that in mind, I invite you to hear this scripture with fresh ears. As a moment in time in the life of Jesus shared with specific people, and retained for us to understand the fullness of God's story of redemption. Let us listen to and hear the story of Holy Week as it comes to us beginning in Luke chapter 22, verse 66. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought Jesus to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man inciting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. 
And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put on an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breast and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, when the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who though a member of the council had not agreed to their plan and action, he came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Holy mystery, help us to continue to learn from this story. Renew within us the ability to place ourselves in this present time and to seek your will. To that end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our salvation. Amen. As we go throughout our lives, one thing that is constant is the passage of time. Each moment we get to breathe becomes a fleeting opportunity to align ourselves with God's will and God's purpose. And I think that might be what this journey of Holy Week invites us into, to look at the challenges of being human, of living with time as our measure and our marker, living with the option to make choices. We started off this morning with the people of Jerusalem welcoming Jesus into their midst. Great excitement. We love him. He's coming here to save us. They get swept up in the emotions of it all. And it's easy to get swept up when things are exciting. It's easy to get swept up without really knowing the full story, not really knowing what might come next. It's also easy to find ourselves on the wrong side without really thinking about it. Because from that first moment, we see such positivity, excitement for Jesus, and then there is a huge shift as soon as Jesus goes before the Roman leader, Pilate. He goes before Pilate. Pilate can't find anything. 
So he sends him to the Jewish ruler of Galilee, Herod. There's no case. There's no case. Back to Pilate. But Jesus is silent through a lot of this. And the leaders, Pilate, Herod, actually become friends when they used to be enemies. But it's the crowd that drives things here. It's the crowd that leads to Jesus' death. This whole story really does pass by very quickly until Jesus is finally sentenced to death by a cross. And then we have the story of him carrying the cross, Simon helping him carry it. Jesus is speaking to the women who are weeping, the women who are so distraught for what is happening. And even the end, as he's hanging upon the cross, pleading forgiveness as a final cry. Time seems to stand still here as Jesus endures unimaginable suffering and humiliation. Yet, his death leads to something more. But we are here in this small snippet of time. Through this enduring story of sacrifice, And in these passages, we are reminded that time is not simply a linear progression of moments, but a sacred opportunity, a chance to experience God's grace and mercy, even when we don't see it. These events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection transcend any constraints of time because they open up eternity and the promise of salvation. As we enter into this particular week, present day, this particular time, I invite you to consider how you are using the time that has been entrusted to you. How you are living with purpose and intentionality seeking to honor God, to be true to who God has called you to be, to make the most of every opportunity, every interaction, to share love, to be invited to figure out how God can use us. I was reminded of the psalmist as I was thinking about time. The psalmist writes, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Numbering our days, keeping track of what we're doing, reminding ourselves that it is in God that we live and move and have our being numbering our days with joy and celebration, and numbering our days when things are challenging, when there is betrayal and pain and even death. One benefit for us is that we actually know the end of the story. We know that the resurrection is on the horizon. Yet I invite you to sit in the emotions of this week. Trust in the promise of God to redeem. Trust in the promise of God to make things new. And trust in the promise of God to endure forever and ever. Amen.
Please be seated. One of the ways that we number our days is by giving of ourselves, our time, our talents, and our treasures. I invite you to give generously as you are able, and also if you have a prayer request, to write it on one of the orange cards and place it in the offering plate. Let us continue in worship.
God, take these gifts and use them to share your love and light in this world so that through our hands you may be made known to others. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated. As a community in faith today, we remember Jason and his family. And we pray for all those who are sick, suffering, or in mourning. Let us come before God in prayer. Holy One, we pray that you would hear our prayers and graft in our minds the same mind that was in Christ, that we might be vessels of your humility and grace. Christ emptied himself, trading in the form of God for the form of human. So we pray for the church and for all the people and all who serve. Form us into a church that empties ourselves for others and for you. Lord Jesus, you were born in human likeness and found in human form. We pray for the whole human family, for the nations of the earth, and for all who live in the midst of disaster, famine, war, and terror. Lord Jesus, even after humbling yourself in your incarnation, you humbled yourself more to the point of death. So we pray for all of those who lead, all of those who live. Bless us with your humility. Lord Jesus, your humility and your love for us was so broad and so deep it cost the cross. We praise, pray for those we love who have died. And as you were highly exalted, may they rest with you in glory. In your exaltation, O Lord, you were given the name that is above every name. So we pray in that name for all who are poor and hungry, and especially those who are hurting in many ways. Grant them your grace. Grant them your peace. And we also pray in your name for those who are sick. Give them the gift of healing, strength, and wholeness. And now, hear us as we offer to you the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
remind you to join us downstairs for the Palm Sunday brunch and egg blessing as we share together in a time of fellowship. Um, and all are welcome, even if you didn't RSVP, so please stick around if you are able. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift you up and give you peace today and always. Amen.